So the first phase is really kind of inception. When the idea strikes that we'd like to build something, how to figure out what that something is and how to make smart decisions about uh, the way to proceed. And then the next segment is going to be um, from green light, so after taking it to the board and, and getting the seal of approval and launching your project, what happens from that point all the way to we're ready to put a shovel in the ground, which in many ways I think is one of the most crucial aspects of the project. Um, I often say that at the conclusion of the pre-construction phase, I can peg with the decent likelihood the potential success of the project based on how the teams have melded, um, what issues have arisen, um, how the financing package looks, the performance of the contractor during the various activities that happen during pre-construction, the relationship between the contractor and the architect at that point. And then the next step is going to be discussing a bit about the actual contracts themselves, where the key concerns are and key provisions. Um, and then I'll just briefly touch on how to proceed with the project. Once all the contracts are in place, lawyers always say that ideally you put ink to page and then lock it in a drawer and never look at it again. Um, but the way parties conduct themselves during the course of the project, the way the channels of communications remain open, the way disputes, which are borderline inevitable, get resolved, um, really does have a, a large effect on the eventual project delivery uh, in the format that everybody is hoping for. So with that roadmap, we can start at the top. So the back of the envelope. An idea is had by someone that they would like to build something. So the question is how to determine what that something is and what the parameters are. And it really comes down to scope, timing, and budget. Those are going to be the three parameters that are going to govern everything that is to come. One of the things we often advise our clients when embarking on a discrete project is, have you considered how this fits into your master plan for your campus writ large? Um, what do you anticipate to be your future needs of the school in the next 10, 15 years? Are there additional programs that you're going to want to have the ability to access in your site? Because that can certainly inform your utilization of space um, and perhaps lead to a phased program that would come in over a number of years without necessarily exhausting your entire physical plant with this one particular project. Um, it also allows a measure of uh, budgeting controls and um, that keys into funding sources. Is it time to launch a capital campaign? When are you best positioned to launch that capital campaign? Um, the launching of a new building is a wonderful point if you are anticipating significant construction in the future. Um, and being mindful of reaching out to the community for uh, donations too far in advance or uh, keeping in mind naming rights that might become available or other resources that may lead to financing the further development of the, of the project uh, in the future. Timing and schedule we find to be key, particularly in the school world. I'm sure you've often found uh, yourself considering if you've done a project, the best time for a project of a modest scope is having it completed during the off season of the summer um, or phasing a project over a number of seasons so that it doesn't have material interference with school operations. Um, another consideration that comes up here is temporary construction and protections. Having the architect and engineer and contractor come up with a logistics plan for uh, blocking off areas where you will be performing construction and coming up with logistics for noisy work, dusty work, work that generates a lot of vibration so that it's not having an adverse effect on school function, which is obviously the, the core mission. Budget is key as well. In the early conceptual design phases that you'll be going through, um, it's difficult to set a number to it. The key function of budget is 
when you engage a design team, as you go through iterations of the project, and hopefully the contractor is at the table as well, and oftentimes either the contractor or a third party cost consultant is producing cost estimates on a regular basis that are testing that design against the budget, it allows you to really sharpen your focus on what are the key elements of the program, um, are they achievable within the budget, and if they are achievable within the budget, do they come with trade-offs that the school is comfortable for, material finishes, um, FF&E, um, it gives you the ability to really set your priorities uh, at an early phase and then to value engineer or reconfigure the design so that you're allocating the dollars to those key functions and not necessarily, uh, and also avoiding a budget bust, which would be um, the other issue involved here. Finally, funding sources. Um, private funding through individual donations, public funding sources, and understanding the constraints on the project that might be uh, related to various sources of pu public funding, whether they be um, city line item allocations or um, oftentimes there are conditions applied to private donations. Um, Various governmental funding programs also come with requirements for certain uh, vetting of contractors, separately bidding of contractors, setting the wages of contractors. Um, so being mindful of that because it will inform your process of bidding the project out through the RFP process and which vendors you're going to want to work with and who are familiar with those programs. Additional thoughts is thinking outside of the box a bit is conducting a zoning analysis on your site, uh, identifying years out a radius, um, because in New York, we don't always have the luxury of being able to build in situ, but identifying a radius of locations where real estate might become available that could be valuable to your purpose. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be next door, and many schools have successfully been able to make that work. And then it becomes a question of what can be built. Um, a rudimentary zoning analysis will give you the initial picture. There's always the possibility of requesting discretionary zoning approvals, either through an action through uh, the City Planning Commission or the Board of Standards and, and Appeals. Um, that also will inform your timetable because zoning changes take a tremendous amount of time. The um, ULERP, Uni Uniform Land Use Review process here in New York City, there's this helpful chart on the City Planning Commission's website that identifies the time period for it, and the minimum is generally 16 months. So you're going to want to account for that, both in terms of your project schedule and in terms of your contracts with your design and construction professionals to make sure that there is, uh, if there are significant down periods when work is not being performed, that you're not inadvertently paying for services that you're not receiving. Um, code development opportunities. Uh, many of our school clients find that with similarly aligned missions and constraints that they can share space with other schools um, to their common benefit. And then it's a question of when to engage the various team members. Uh, oftentimes parties will start with one individual uh, consultant or party that they feel most comfortable with and then look to flesh out the team. But doing that in a strategic way is very important. That leads us to the next slide. Um, the first team is the school's team, the internal team. Um, and I included this bullet uh, because it's important to come up with a construction committee and governance structure that works. Um, it is wonderful and important to be inclusive, but having a hundred person board and attempting to administer the entire project through that board um, can be an, an exercise in frustration. So we find it's key to identify a small subset. Um, oftentimes it ranges from three to five to 10 individuals who can comprise the construction committee. And generally you're looking for individuals who have gravitas and buy-in from the various constituencies and who can speak for the various constituencies because these will be the individuals who are giving input to the program um, who are really uh, extracting from the intended user base what the what would be helpful to them and what would advance the school's uh, needs. So from that, switching to the external team, 
So there's actually a gating question of project management and whether that is an internal function or an external function. Um, I've worked on successful projects that have worked it both ways. Um, and oftentimes clients have wonderful facility staff. Um, but even if that facilities individual is uh, excellent at their job, managing a full construction project is a full-time job in and of itself and can certainly divert from the uh, mainline activities of keeping the lights on for the balance of the campus. So oftentimes our clients find value in partnering with an owner's representative firm. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but just in case, these are private organizations, oftentimes comprised of, of past construction and design professionals who are what I like to think of as the skilled eyes and ears of owners who don't do these types of projects on a regular basis. Um, and we find that often having those skilled professionals kind of minding the store and taking a very active role in the entire process from um, the concepting design phase through the RFPs, through construction uh, and claim administration uh, often pays for itself in terms of cost savings over the life of the project versus going it alone. And then there are the additional parties. So the, the other keys are the design professionals, which are generally going to be, uh, the key that everyone thinks of is the architect. Um, in, there is a trend often to have a design architect coupled with an executive architect, and that can be uh, a benefit for fundraising purposes. Um, name brand architects who can attach their name to the project and create a wonderful rendering and then partner with a either a local firm or a firm that's more skilled in, in kind of the nuts and bolts rather than the, the pretty pictures, if you will, to actually execute the project and create the drawings that will ultimately be bid and filed for permitting. One of the other concerns here is who holds the subconsultants? Because the architecture firm is complemented by a number of sub-disciplines uh, depending on your project. I and mean, the one the the one that immediately jumps to mind are the engineering uh, professionals, you know, structural, engineering, mechanical, fire, civil, landscape. Um, and then there are also specialty consultants that run the gamut from uh, lighting consultants to acoustical consultants to closeout consultants, environmental consultants, facade consultants. Um, it could be an extensive list. Uh, and deciding which of those consultants are going to be engaged directly by the owner and which are going to be engaged under the umbrella of the architect is a key consideration for several reasons. Um, there's a pricing aspect to it. Architects who are going to administer subconsultants are going to want to mark up on the fees charged by those subconsultants. But the benefit received for that markup is one-stop shopping. It's akin to having a general contractor with subcontractors. You don't have to look behind the general contractor to look to the performance and potential conflicts between the general contractor and the subcontractor. That all has to happen behind the veil. And it's similar in the architecture world to one of the concerns is you would have the structural, mechanical, electrical, engineering uh, trades developing their drawings and then providing them to the architect. Now, if you have hired the electrical engineer and the architect uh, is not directly engaged with them and there's a conflict between their drawings ultimately you realize that a, a HVAC duct has to go somewhere where it was anticipated an electrical run will go they're gonna point fingers at one another and say it's his fault it's his fault having it all under one umbrella and having a single party responsible for a complete and consolidated set of drawings and design um, can be a real benefit in avoiding those issues and when that's not the case, and the owner is separately holding these um, design subconsultants, what we generally require is that at the outset of the project, they set up a timeline and matrix, identifying at what points they're going to be exchanging their designs with each other for review and comment. And at a final point, there will be a speak now forever hold your peace. And ultimately, the architect of record is going to have the responsibility for integrating that design into the final set of drawings that they're gonna generate for the project. So it's attempting as best as we can to get the benefit of that uh, coordination effort without necessarily having those subconsultants under that umbrella. Onto the construction manager, um, there's a number of considerations, um, union versus non-union, experience with similar projects, financial wherewithal, and these are all things that can be vetted during the RFP process. Um, 
generally there, there's a small subset of contractors who tend to work in the school space and have garnered a reputation because as you know, schools are unique places and there are requirements. Um, for example, as I was alluding to earlier about not creating interference with a campus, complying with security protocols of punching in and out with uh, ID cards, um, knowing that there are going to be quiet hours during development if it's uh, if construction, if it's taking place during school hours, and uh, working through those issues um, is, is a really important uh, element. One of the other considerations here, which we'll get to in a moment, is when to bring them on as well. Um, and there's kind of two approaches. You can complete the design with the architect and then bid it out uh, to various construction firms and have them come into the project. But utilizing a slightly different contracting structure, you can engage a contractor for pre-construction and they wouldn't necessarily be the contractor that gets the entire job. You wanna hold out that carrot and provide that once you finish the pre-con project and you complete the drawings, either pursuant to a fixed formula, which would be a GMP structure, or a bid scenario, they would then um, produce a number for uh, undertaking that work and being obligated to perform it at a set price and schedule. And you would then have the right to go forward with them or not. Your ultimate uh, leverage being you could always take the drawings, which you should own, and we'll get to that in a moment, and bid it to someone else if they're not coming in at a competitive price. Um, and then there's a nod to the attorneys, uh, admittedly a bit of self-interest on this one, um, but in a bit of an admission against interest, it's a bit paradoxical, but often involving the attorney early on can be a real cost savings in terms of legal expense because, um, as we'll discuss uh, in a moment, one of the things that I often recommend to our clients, especially in the space to do, is to assemble a form of contract for your architect and for your contractor and to bid those out with your RFP. You will find that the uh, level of comment you receive back when the architects and contractors are still actively bidding for the job will be far fewer than what you would otherwise expect once you've awarded the project. So by handling the process that way and in requiring that all comments come in with their response to the RFP, you really cut down on the negotiation process and accordingly the legal spend. And there's also advice to be had when it appears there might be some issues with the team coming together, um, which is the other key component of assembling this team. In engaging in a robust pre-construction um, exercise, you basically will get to test before you're out there in the trenches, whether or not the team is coming together. If the architecture side of the house and the construction side of the house are at each other's throat through pre-con, it's likely to continue through construction, and that can be a difficult way to go through a project. Sometimes there's need for it, and there's um, you know process to be gone, gone through to resolve those differences, um, but whether or not the project team really comes together, and there is a faith that everyone is gonna deal with each other um, civilly as the project goes on and not necessarily try and point fingers or unnecessarily um, defame the others, it really informs the, the tone of the project as you proceed into construction. So other considerations before we're getting into the um, actual contracting phase are, as we discussed, capital campaign. Um, there's also, we've had experience in the past uh, in assisting with the drafting of, of contribution pledges in a way that are financeable. So that's another creative and alternative source of financing. Um, generally, it's not cost feasible unless the project is of a certain size, but it's a valuable asset that can be uh, securitized for a financing. Um, one of the other considerations you want to have here as part of pre-construction to build into your agreements is what you anticipate you're gonna need from the project team to engage in those fundraising efforts in terms of mock-ups, renderings, personal attendance at presentations, especially when you have one of those uh, star architects engaged to be a design architect, and building in the costs and time deliverables uh, for those items early on um, is important because it will enable you then to have the most successful capital campaign and to bring in the dollars that ultimately decide what can be built. So then there's what actually happens during pre-construction. Um, so it's a robust exercise and there's a 
a number of, of exercises that go on. So first is cost estimating, which is what we were discussing earlier. As the design is being baked, and you're gonna go through concept design, schematic design, design development onto construction documents. Concept design is really the pretty pictures on the back of the envelope. Um, schematic design begins to flesh out the actual layout of the space, the bulk, the massing, the program that's gonna be located in various floors and areas. Design development then advances that to further detail. What are the room layouts going to look like? What are the FF&E layouts going to look like? You begin to get a sense of what the actual space will look like. And the construction documents are full boat drawings that tell the contractor every last detail of what the wattage of the light bulbs are going to be and what the gauge of the wiring is going to be um, and what the trim around the doorways is going to look like. So that the idea being as fully baked a set of documents as possible so that when you put those out to bid, all of the bidders are competing on equal footing because they know exactly what needs to be constructed. So cost estimating generally will be exercised at each of these levels of design, sometimes twice per phase, um, in order to allow the owner to say, all right, when we look at the material labor costs as they stand right now, and sometimes those can fluctuate through matters not related to design. The cost of steel can go up, the cost of labor can go up, depending on how the market is going. Um, we discovered that we are over budget by this amount. And how do we get back to it? That's actually one of the key elements in an architect agreement that we'll get to um, a bit later in the presentation. And who is responsible then for bringing that design back into budget? Was it simply because the owner decided to add a wing. If there are discretionary changes, generally that would, the owner would be responsible for that redesign. But if you gave a clear budget and a clear program and the architect designed something that once cost estimated doubles your budget, obviously that's not gonna be of any use to anyone. So the obligation would be upon them to bring that design back into alignment with the budget so that it can then be constructed at the budget figure. Value engineering is the process for, through which that occurs. Um, now, value engineering is, uh, in the broadest sense, coming up with creative ways to do what you want to do in a different and less expensive way. Um, oftentimes, depending on the skill of the design team and the realities of the project, that can just amount to material substitution or scope cutting, which is the less artful way to value engineer. The goal is to come up really with creative solutions that still get you to the same end place, rather than cutting out rooms, uh, substituting materials to below the standard of finish that you're looking to achieve, um, and otherwise reducing the budget that way. Constructability analysis, uh, again, that's with a robust design team that would include um, all of your various consultants, and catching these kinds of coordination issues, structural design issues, um, loading issues. Do you have uh, equipment that isn't being discussed right now that ultimately is gonna be very heavy and on a high floor. Um, that will go to the structural design of the building. Is going through basically the, uh, the design through each stage of the process and determining that yes, it can actually be built in the way that it's being drawn. Um, due diligence both into, into um, the project site, uh, into the, the backgrounds of the various consultant teams and early scopes. There may be scopes that in order to save time, even though you're not ready to launch the full project, it makes sense. Early de uh, demolition, early uh, grading and site work. Um, <clears throat> engaging, if you've determined you want a particular facade project, oftentimes there are long lead times of material fabrication. So if you've uh, decided on a certain materials package selection, getting those orders in process. Uh, those can all save time down the line. But the goal, however, is basically define all the budget busts, the, the design flaws, the scheduling snags, coming up with phasing that makes sense for the project before the shovel's in the ground. Because discovering those issues when you're mid-construction um, is a, a far less comfortable experience. You'll have to think fleet on your feet to find ways to address them. All right. So now we uh, are, are advancing, we've gotten the green light from the board, how do we get to breaking ground? So how do we put together those teams? How do we get the contracts in place? There are various contracting styles for your prime contractor that you're gonna be working with. Um, a lump sum is simply, you have an agreed set of plans and specifications. 
The contractor is going to act as a general contractor and engage subconsultants. You won't have any visibility into the costs of those subconsultants. Um, they will then promise, however, to get it built for you at a particular price by a particular date. So there's far less administration, as you'll see in some of these other forms. Um, everything would happen kind of behind the veil. Um, and the key to that is having drawings that are as advanced as possible so that when you do bid that out and get your loan price, some prices, you really are getting uh, an equal view as to what everyone is offering. A GMP is an alternative structure. It's the guaranteed maximum price. It's often utilized when you have robust participation by the contractor in the pre-construction phase. So rather than agreeing upon a price, what you're agreeing upon is a formula. The, we will go out and bid this work, and on an open book basis, we're going to show you what all the sub consultants, what subcontractors come back at, and we're going to look at all those numbers, and that's going to total to an item called trade cost. Once we know what that trade cost is, we're going to apply our multipliers, and those multipliers are going to be the fee that's going to go to the construction manager for performing this role, the insurance, um, general conditions, which are basically everything that the contractor has to incur in costs that has, is not actually going to be incorporated into the building. So if those are things like temporary electricity, site security, um, garbage hauling, uh, rental fees, things you're going to have to pay for, but it won't ultimately be an element of your building. Um, so I think I mentioned fee, general conditions. Generally, there'll be a contingency that the owner will want to control usage of, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's going to be, um, for some projects, also depending on your funding sources, there may be bonds that are a multiplier as well. Um, I think I mentioned insurance. Uh, and basically what you do is you have that agreed formula, and after you have the trade costs, after you're done bidding out to all of these subcontractors, at the conclusion of the bidding process, the contractor applies that formula and gives you a proposal and you sign an amendment. And that amendment says, here's the final drawings and specifications. Here is what the guaranteed maximum price is going to be. We will track every dollar that's spent on this project, but I, contractor, am guaranteeing to you that if it goes over that number, that's my responsibility and not yours. Subject, of course, to change orders for unforeseen conditions, uh, design errors, et cetera. It's another element to be discussed. Um, CM as agent is a role that's often utilized when you have um, city funding for a project. That is a structure by which the CM is not actually taking the risk or holding the contracts for the subcontractors. They are acting as kind of an owner's rep on steroids. They're administering the process for you. They're soliciting the bids of the, of the trade contractors. They're out on the project site managing the project on a day-to-day -day basis, organizing deliveries. And for that, they're going to be entitled to a fee, um, which can be a multiplier of the cost. You want to be careful with that because it does create an incentive. Obviously, the higher the cost of the work, the higher the fee would be. Um, cost plus fee is a variation on that same theme. Um, and then there's design build, which um, in New York actually uh, technically is a very difficult thing to do because... New York holds that a contractor cannot perform the profession of architecture, even if they have separately contracted with an architect. So the only technically permissible format for that is architect-led design build, because the architect is not similarly constrained in not being able to practice um, construction, but the inverse is true. A contractor can't practice the professional discipline of architecture. Um, so those are, are difficult projects. Um, and also there's a valuable check and balance that often happens between the architect and the contractor, which is foregone in that context. Uh, we certainly do a fair uh, bit of these, um, but often for, for school projects, it's one of the earlier contract styles that we've discussed. So as I said earlier, the key is to bid the contract with the RFP and to own all submissions that come back, especially at the architecture phase. Um, there have been cases where responsive architects um, will say that an element of the final design of the building that you proceeded with was stolen from their RFP submission and they weren't selected to be the architect. Um, so it is important to own all of the intellectual property that comes back as responses to the RFP process um, on the architecture side of the house. But in both contexts, what we often provide is contractor or architect attaches the form of agreement that we intend to use for this. This is being shared with all responsive bidders. And our intention is that you will be expected to execute this contract 
subject only to changes that you propose now and that we ultimately agree to. So please provide your full comments to this agreement at this time. You'll get a range of responses, some of which will be, we have no problem with the contract. That one actually worries me the most <laughs> because either they haven't read it or they want the project just that bad. Uh, oftentimes you'll get a bullet list. Um, we have issues with the indemnity, the uh, no damage for delay clause, the, they'll go down their, their list and identify the, the things that they want to put a pin in to discuss. Other times you'll get a full markup to the agreement. Now it wouldn't really be economical to simultaneously negotiate with all bidders at once. So what often happens is the owner's rep or other project party will assemble all the comments into a leveling chart, much like you would have when you're leveling bids, and say, here are the issues the various contractors had, here are potential solutions, but you can do it at a very high level without actually engaging in a negotiation with every one of the responsive bidders. Oftentimes, through kind of a natural process, the lead parties are identified, and it's winnowed down to a group of generally two or three architects or contractors who are gonna be in final consideration. Oftentimes, we will then advance the negotiation with that with those two parties, with the goal being, prior to actually awarding the contract, we're in a position to have a fully negotiated contract. So it's signature ready once the award is made. That is when the leverage is greatest uh, and you'll obtain the best result. And ultimately, it's a cost savings because once the award is made, starting from scratch negotiating the architect agreement or the construction contract can be an arduous process because there's... Uh, a leverage loss and a feeling that the project is theirs to be lost and unless it really comes to blows that they can hold their ground and get the provisions that they're looking for. Again, it's a benefit to bid as complete a design as possible. One, you're going to get the most parity between the bids and the ability to look at the bids on a level playing field. And two, you're going to eliminate a lot of the opportunity for the contractor to then claim that there were ambiguities or errors in the design that are then leading to change orders. If the drawings are at, call it 80% CDs, which oftentimes people bid, they're relatively advanced at that point, but to the extent any clarifications come up after that point that are inconsistent with what's in the 80% set, you're gonna likely see a request from the contractor for a change order. So we can, although time is always of the essence in any construction project, you can gain time and gain savings and costs by uh, completing the, the drawings to the extent possible beforehand. We discussed already who would be holding the key subconsultants, but that then informs this process of what the form of agreement looks like when it goes out in the RFPs and whether you're simultaneously submitting, uh, soliciting other bidders. Um, oftentimes, architects, engineers, uh, contractors have parties that they are most comfortable with, with working with and identifying those parties at this phase, if they're not going to be brought to the team by the design professionals, um, can lead to cost savings because there's a level of comfort with who they're going to be partnering for this project. All right. So we have all of our, uh, all of our, our folks selected and it's time to get into the nitty gritty of the contract. Um, so now we're into the situation of, of project launch and how we get from here to ribbon cutting. So what should be in the contract? We talked about awarding the contract prior to uh, I'm sorry, negotiating the contract prior to awarding the job to a particular architect or contractor, which should hopefully go without saying, but which we see very often, is not commencing work with those parties until their agreement is executed. And if you can imagine the shift in levers that takes place once the uh, award is made, if you are, I've seen projects where the contract isn't executed until half of the work is done especially on the architecture side, or you're approaching CDs, in which case there's not a lot of uh, leverage to force a result or a resolution of the dispute when the counterpart in the service provider knows at that point it's extremely unlikely that you're going to change horses. Um, so another cautionary tale. Um, so the form of the agreements, uh, Venable as a practice, unless it's for very small scopes, generally prefers not to use the AIA forms of agreements. Um, the AIA, for those unfamiliar, is the American Institute of Architects. Um, and they've gone through several revisions and iterations through the years, and there's a form for, for every type of project. Um, and I have tremendous respect for, for architects. Um, but we find that they're, they tend, one, to be a bit difficult to read, two, are not terribly owner-friendly, and three, when you start making significant modifications to them, 
the document becomes unwieldy very quickly. Um, so for all those reasons, generally we prefer to use a custom form and we have a range of forms tailored to the various contracting structures as well as the size of the project. You know, imposing a 120 page GMP on a $4 million project uh, is not going to be in the interest of any party. So we can tailor it to the particular uh, needs of the project and the size of the project. Okay, so the architect agreement. What are some of the key considerations and the key provisions that you're going to want to negotiate in that document? In my view, one of the less appreciated but most important provisions in an architect agreement is ownership of the drawings. Oftentimes the original impression of an architect seeking to own this design is, uh, you know, it's a mix of art and science, but this is their work product and they generally tend to like to use the term work product or instruments of service in the document drafting. The AIA refers to them as instruments of service. And so why shouldn't they own them? I only need it for this particular project. Maybe I can license it from them. Um, but the difficulty is it can have insidious implications that are more so than just what you would think of in the ordinary course of intellectual property. The issue being, if they own those drawings, there is the ability, if a dispute were to arise, to say, I own these, you have defaulted under the agreement, you no longer have the right to use these documents, and I am gonna to file to enjoin your continued construction of the project using my design. And in that instance, you can only imagine, your carry costs are continuing, um, you have a school year that's about to commence, that creates an undue amount of leverage um, that can be, you know, a gun to the head to require completion, uh, resolution of that dispute on terms that the owner might otherwise not be interested in agreeing to. Um, oftentimes, ownership will also be attempted to be linked to payment in full of all sums due, uh, and that can become a very murky area. Oftentimes, architects will insist that they need this in order to ensure payment, but I would say in those instances, that's really more germane to circumstances where you have a, a private development, and your entity simply owns the property and otherwise doesn't have a lot of assets and can go bankrupt or disappear overnight, leaving you with a very large bill. The reality in the school's context is you have an institution that's been around in many cases for a number of years. We have a physical location. We have students appearing at that location. We're not going anywhere. If there's a monetary dispute, you know where to find us. There's going to be a dispute resolution mechanism, and that's the appropriate forum for resolving monetary disputes, not holding the project hostage until that dispute is resolved. Design to budget is another key consideration. As I said, if the design team generates a set of drawings, that after cost estimation, it's realized, can only be billed for double your budget. It doesn't do anyone any good. Oftentimes, though, architects will appropriately respond I could design the project that as of this moment can be built for owner stated budget, but if costs change in the marketplace and then the budget is exceeded, but it's the same design that worked six months ago, I shouldn't be responsible for that. And that's certainly a fair ask. Um, so there are different mechanisms we use to bridge that gap, either uh, tying the demonstration that the cost escalation is tied to those outside factors that the architect is not responsible for, um, creating a fudge factor by which if the drawings, uh, the cost estimation exceeds the budget by only a small percentage, then owner will either live with that exceedance or pay as an additional service to bring it back down under that threshold. Um, so you're protected basically from, uh, you know, small movements in the price, but if there's a drastic movement in the price, you would get the redesign for free. Um, Insurance and indemnity is another issue that is always focused on. Uh, oftentimes, folks will send it off to their insurance broker and write back and say, this is what my insurance broker says, the insurance and the indemnity has to say. Um, and I don't always agree with that because you'll, you'll find interesting circumstances where they'll say, well, my insurance carrier says that um, I'm not covered for my intentional or grossly negligent acts, so that should be excluded from the indemnity. <laughs> That may very well be true, but if you come to the project site and you hit someone in the head with a hammer, even if your insurance will not respond to that claim, 
you should still be financially responsible for the repercussions of that circumstance. Um, oftentimes also, uh, design professionals will seek to limit their liability to the available proceeds of the professional liability policy. And there are two issues of consideration with that. One is the liability that can arise under a design contract is not limited only to uh, professional liability. They also carry uh, general liability, CGL coverage, just like everyone else does for slips and falls, et cetera. And in those circumstances, um, they should have an obligation to defend owner and to uh, provide coverage. They won't agree to defend the owner under their professional liability policy. And the reason for that is professional liability functions much the way malpractice insurance functions for attorneys. The only person who can be made whole by that is the person who those services were to be delivered to. So if uh, a, there's a design error that leads to a liability event, the only person who can be a beneficiary of that payment is the owner. None of the other additional insurers, any of the financing parties, any of the other consultants on the project will be able to, to be a beneficiary of that policy. They'll also look to cap liability, as I said earlier, at the available limits of that policy. And what I will generally try and negotiate under that circumstance is it's not available limits. Because if, you have, if this particular design professional has uh, claim activity all over the city on various, on various other projects, and the limits of that policy have been eroded down, you don't want to cap their liability, even though they have two, three, four, five million dollars of professional liability coverage, if only half a million dollars is left in the kitty after all of the other claims have been instituted. So the goal will be to have exposure to the personal assets of the entity above and beyond that up to the stated limit. So up to, let's say the, the agreement requires a $2 million professional liability policy. We would agree it's appropriate to agree to a cap and I'd say 80 to 90% of architect agreements I see have a negotiated cap but we generally advocate for that stated limit rather than what's, whatever's available when your claim gets in the door. One of the other key considerations is no stopping of work. The mantra once the project launches is the project continues. And you'll see this both in the architect agreement and in the construction contract. There shouldn't be an ability of any party to say, hey, we're engaged in a dispute. Let's stop the project until we resolve it. Because as we discussed with ownership of the drawings, it's that same gun to the head leverage. As time is ticking and carry costs are mounting, it can force a resolution that is inequitable. So there are various measures that are, are used to try and achieve this. Generally, um, it's proposed that work will stop if a payment is a certain amount of time late, um, which is fine, but that should be a significant amount of time and there should be significant notices that take place. Again, on the theory that they know where you're located, you're not going anywhere, and if they were to institute a, a claim to be paid for amounts that they're truly due uh, to be paid, that's the proper method of resolving that dispute. Um, it'll also generally be tied to if there are disputes as to, in the architect's context, additional services. So additional services are like a change order for an architect. Here is a new thing I had to design or change that wasn't anticipated in my base scope, and so I should be paid extra. And oftentimes architects will request, if there is a certain amount of additional services, we hit a certain threshold number, I should be able to stop work until you pay me that amount. For all the reasons that we've discussed, I don't feel that's, that's an appropriate resolution to that issue. So it's another thing to be mindful of in the contract. So now we can talk a bit about key provisions in construction contracts. So one term you often see thrown around is liquidated damages. Um, and then there's also the concept of a no damage for delay clause. Now the two aren't mutually exclusive, but I often find there's advocacy for one versus the other. I generally don't favor liquidated damages. I'd say they're using about 25% of my contracts. And the reason being, it's a very comforting thing to see on the page that for every day that the project is late, the contractor will be back charged X dollars. But if you've ever reached the point in the project where things have gone awry and there is a heated dispute between the owner and the architect, sending a demand letter and saying, according to my math, you owe me $50,000, I expect a check in a week, you seldom see a pile of money appear in a FedEx box in response to that demand. 
So clawing those funds out of the contractor can be a very difficult exercise. And at that point, you're going to be in a dispute resolution proceeding in any event. On top of that, the term liquidated damages means that you are setting a number. You are liquidating to a fixed dollar figure what your maximum damages can be for those delays. And when the project really goes off the rails and you have exceeded the cap, and generally contractors will require a cap on that figure, the cap number of liquidated damages, there's essentially no more incentive then to complete the project because they've already fallen off that cliff. It's not getting any better. So it doesn't have that incentive effect to really force them to complete the project as soon as possible. Um, a no damage for delay clause is slightly different. What that basically says is, the only way you're compensated for actual delays is if the owner or the architect causes it. If we refuse to select materials or there is, we exclude the contractor from the site and lock the gates, if we cause a delay, then the contractor will be compensated for that delay. But if it's a no fault delay, and it's not the contractor's fault, it's not the owner's fault, then that delay will be, uh, the only remedy for that will be an extension of time, not the payment of additional general conditions costs. Because all those items that we talked about uh, in general conditions, back office, expenditures, et cetera, those are costs that are gonna continue to mount. And if the contractor knows that they're gonna be responsible for those costs on a going forward basis, it creates an incentive to get off this project and onto the next one where it'll be profitable again and really drives towards the conclusion that everyone should have at that point of having skin of the game to complete the project and move on. Um, managing use of contingency funds. Now there, contingency funds can be thought of in, in, very, in many different ways. In a lump sum context, generally that'll just be a reserve that the owner is going to keep on the side. It's not going to be an element of the actual construction contract, but it's an amount, a rainy day fund for overages and unanticipated events. In a GMP agreement, where the structure is really based on what that fixed cost is with multipliers, you'll generally have a percentage of that trade cost as a contingency. And you wanna be careful that owner has approval rights over the use of that contingency. That contingency is owned by ownership and it is for unforeseen things, but it is never usable for things that were the fault of contractor. If there are delays because the contractor failed to order materials in advance, um, if there are, uh, if the contractor didn't schedule delivery so that they would arrive on time, if they schedule two contractors to work in the same area at the same time, those aren't things contingency can be used for. But unforeseen conditions, um, strike, fire, um, weather occurrences, those are items that would be appropriate usages of contingency funds. You wanna make sure you're complying with funding requirements and that you're requiring con contractor to require any documentation that might be required to meet your funding requirements. If you're subject to Vendex or prevailing wage, that they're keeping the proper books so that if the project is audited or if there are submissions that are required in order, or MWBE, other requirements that might be applicable to the project, that you have the documentation necessary to prove that you've complied with the requirements of those funding sources. There's a concept, this is something germane to, to not-for-profits, so it often comes up in the school context. If it's the type of work that has a number of elements that need to be purchased that won't be incorporated into the project, things like drop cloths and paintbrushes and hammers, those don't actually go into the project, but they're things that are purchased. And though the things that are incorporated into the project will be exempt from sales tax as a not-for-profit, because, be also because, I'm sorry, that it's a capital project, that's fine, but all the other purchases of drop cloths and hammers and paintbrushes will not be exempt from tax. And that tax will be passed along to the owner who is a sales tax exempt entity. So there is a structure and it is complex, so it's worthwhile to make sure that there is gonna be a significant amount allocable to that sales tax, whereby you can appoint the agents, the contractor as your agent on a limited basis. And they need to have the ability to commit the funds and credit of the organization in making these purchases. But there are ways to silo that off in which case they become an extension of the organization. So just like an employee going to the corner store to buy a roll of paper towels can demonstrate, hey, I'm sales tax exempt, they would be able to do that in purchases of these materials that are not gonna be incorporated into the site. We, all, we already talked about no stopping of work. It's the analogous concept here in the construction context. It's when that work is stopped that the greatest leverage is achieved. So you wanna make sure where this generally comes up is disputed work. They think something is a change order and was not reflected in the drawings and not their base obligation. 
and you have a difference of opinion and say, no, I think this is warranty work. I think this is something that was implied in the drawings. I think this is something you were obligated to pay for your fixed price. The mechanism there is track your costs on a time and material basis. We can live to fight about it another day, but that claim doesn't arise until the work is substantially complete. So proceed with it now. You don't have the right to say, I'm not doing that work. Um, shared savings is a concept that arises in the GMP whereby if the contract price comes in under that guaranteed maximum price, there'd be a splitting of that savings between the contractor and the owner. I find that one, it's generally very theoretical. Projects magically often generally arrive at right at the GMP price. And two, it can create an unintended incentive to kind of cut corners and find creative ways to get the benefit of the savings. Um, Lead is another consideration. A lot of, many of our school projects are, are going for a lead rating, either to meet funding requirements or as part of, of donor gifts or just part of being an environmentally conscious citizen in, in New York. And then there are items with special campus considerations such as scheduling the projects during the off season, temporary construction as we discussed in school uh, activities are, are going to be in operations, security concerns, um, and other things that are really germane to the school environment, which we uh, have a, a fixed schedule to our contract that, you know, it's to be tailored to every project, but it's a good starting point. No smoking also, by the way. We, we try and maintain that one. <laughs>